Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Babe Bitcoin and Blockchain Evolution podcast. I am Sarah Herring, joined by Matt Davio, and we are very lucky to have with us a guest today, Rob Finch. Now, Rob, I know you have your own podcast, so we very much appreciate your time coming on to this podcast with us. Um, you are the founder of ICO Alert, which actually several other of our guests have talked about when we were talking about where we find the best ICOs, where we can awesome. find what's what's the newest and latest coming out. So thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. So I think the the first obvious question to just get us going is what is ICO Alert and and how did you come to to found this genius little project? Yeah, so it's it's kind of an interesting story. So if we go back to 2012 or 2013 when I first found out about Bitcoin, um, got really interested in the space and kind of you know, as I think most people do, just kind of dove down that rabbit hole. Um, and then at the end of 2016, early 2017, when ICOs really started to take off, um, it, it was pretty interesting to, you know, log on one day and, and talk with, you know, a group of friends who were kind of trading and go, oh, wow, this ICO sold out in, in 35 seconds, but I didn't know about it. Um, you know, where was this? How could I have found out about this before it sold out and have been a part of it? So uh, ICO Alert was really created... Uh, never with the intention to be a website for other people to use, and, and of course, never to be a business. Um, it was really just as a, a website for my brother Mike and I to you know, track these ICOs and make sure that we didn't miss out on, on the ones that we were really excited about. So put up a website um, April of last year, just you know, for the two of us to kind of track them and eventually word got out to the community. I, I made a Reddit post, and uh, we found that the community had that same need to, to kind of have a comprehensive list of ICOs. So very simply, and one sentence, ICO Alert maintains the only comprehensive list of pre-ICOs and ICOs. Uh, last year, we tracked more than 1,848 ICOs in 2017. So, huge amount. Sorry, guys. I, I Sometimes when I, I get a little... That was ab that's absolutely <laughs> yeah. insane. And 1,848 is a lot. Um, yeah, it is a lot. And they didn't all, of course, you know, hit their caps. But ultimately, I think the average amount raised was about $4 million dollars which works out to about 7 billion total raised by ICOs last year. I was going to ask you, uh, so that was the total 7 billion actually yeah. issued. What about this year? Do, do you have any tracking? Do you have a runway that kind of shows projections that could be 30? Because a couple of people have told us 3,500 this year. Wow. I could, I could definitely see that happening. I mean, if you look at the last 30 days of, of what we listed on our site, since we are listing every ICO that exists on ICO Alert, um, last 30 days, about 500. So we may even surpass that, that projection. Wow. Yeah. So just in, just in February, 500 ICOs. Yeah. And that's, that's 500 ICOs. I should clarify that we're listed, not necessarily yeah. all launching in February. No, um, but if that picks up and we continue to list 500 a month, I mean, it, we could go into the, the thousands. Give, give our listeners an idea of uh, once they get listed to the actual day they drop, you know, what does that timeline look like to get to that $4 million average? Um, yeah. you know, how, does that, how does that process look? It, it varies a lot. So it's interesting, uh, about nine out of 10 ICOs that exist come to us first. You know, they know that we're the comprehensive source, so they come and, and they send us some details. Um, it, it really varies pretty widely. You know, sometimes an ICO will, will reach out um, as soon as two weeks ahead of the start of their ICO, which we definitely don't recommend. I think you need a lot more time to, to go out there and really uh, engage the community, you know, convince them that what you're offering is, is a, a valid idea and something they should participate in. Um, and then some of the ICOs that we've seen as more successful um, may take three to, to sometimes even six months to kind of let the community digest their idea, maybe run a pre-sale round, um, you know, run a, a bounty campaign or something like that. So it, it varies widely, two weeks to, to several months. You know, I think there's a lot of conversation and a lot of people who are saying, oh, you know, like this percentage of ICOs are scams. There's also a huge percentage of people that we talk to who are very clearly saying that, you know, like when you read the white papers and you can see that this project has some sort of value, you know, outside of just the tokenization of something. Um, as someone who's seeing all these different, the gamut of things that ICOs have to offer, what are some of the things that you look for when you're looking for something to potentially invest in? Yeah, and I should preface this for my lawyer's sake so they don't get mad at me that none of what I say is investment, financial, tax, or legal advice. Um, but when I look for ICOs, I look for something that 
um, you know, first of all, really needs a token. I think there are a lot of ICOs right now that are, you know, they had a business model, maybe they were trying to launch a startup and they found out about ICOs and they went, oh, okay, how can we cram a token into our business model so that we can launch an ICO and, and get access to some of this capital? Um, so that's first and foremost, looking for something that, you know, really requires a token, whether it's a utility token or maybe an STO, like a security token offering, which I think we're going to see a lot of this year. Um, but then also just in general, I think a really good place to start is to always look at the team. You can really tell a lot about a project based on the people that are running it. So if you go to a, a team page, even if you haven't heard of those people, if you look into their background and you see, oh, okay, this person's you know, been in the blockchain space for a while, or maybe they ran another successful startup in, in that same industry. Uh, I think starting with a team is, is really a great indication of um, you know, just initially how successful a project could be. Sorry, I keep like muting and unmuting because there's a lot of background noise here. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> at the hour that I'm at. So you, I mean, you in fact got on, on the train, which I think a lot of people that we speak to do around 2012, 2013. Since then, as we're talking about, I mean, if we have 500 so far in, in 2018, things are obviously go, going a little bit on the crazy yeah. side. What are, some, like, what are some of the places that you're looking for? What are some of the sites you see, the places that you, you trust and listen to when you're trying to sort of filter out and weed through all of, I guess, the information we're being inundated with at this point? Definitely. I mean, to, to, of course, plug ICO Alert, I think that's a great place to kind of start the discovery process. So that's, I think, the space that we dominate right now being that comprehensive list. So when you're looking for new ICOs, you want to know, you know, hey, what were those 500 ICOs that were listed last month? You can go to icoalert.com and check it all out there. Um, but additionally, I think there's a lot of really, really great community generated content um, in a couple different places. The first would be Medium. So if you go to Medium and you start to um, you know, read some crypto content, read content and, and post by ICOs and start to really interact with that content, whether it's, you know, giving it applause or, or following some writers that you like. It's interesting, Medium kind of learns over time that, hey, this person's interested in crypto. And, and they even added a category of interest, I believe. Um, they either call it cryptocurrency or blockchain, but you, you can add that as your interest and they'll actually suggest some really good content. Um, and I, I've, I found some content on there from some pretty um, unknown writers that I wouldn't have found otherwise if I wasn't on Medium. Um, but I, I, agree. I, I, yeah. I agree, and I'm a big, I, I'm a big uh, reader of Medium. And, and, awesome. Uh, and it's funny because I was looking for this type of service just to see, and I read your, I'm like, oh, of course somebody came up with ICO Alert. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's, you know, as a trader, uh, I, I, I go back to like the late 90s when we had basically IPO you know, every other day, just right. like you're having ICOs. So this is the new generation of that. The one thing that I love about how you, like right when you come to your site, I love how you categorize pre-ICOs, ICOs, and then you have subcategorized simple columns, active pre-ICOs, upcoming pre-ICOs. So I like the linear nature. So people yeah. can kind of, you know, if they're kind of that, that, linear brain they can look at it from a calendar perspective but then you can dive in within you know not only the linear perspective but you can get into kind of hey i'm interested in medical uh and i know you guys wrote an article today about yeah. you know an, a, a new uh, blockchain uh, on the medical side so i like how you can look at it by category it's really it's really slick you've done a really nice effective simple way but very detailed and what you offer and, and, and what people can find. I appreciate that. And if you think of uh, you know, that pre-ICO list and that ICO list as kind of our first two investment tools, if you will, um, we're really looking later this year you know, in, into you know, the rest of 2018, but also into 2019 um, to, to build more of those investment tools. So something may be you know, an exchange alert. So we can say, hey, uh, we know you were interested in this ICO. It's now listed on exchanges. Um, you know, here's an email alert about that. So uh, we're really looking to add more value there, not only, you know, improving our existing lists and the design and kind of the user experience of those lists, um, but to also add additional tools that will, um, you know, hopefully bring more people like you to our site. And let's talk a little bit about your podcast. Is yeah. this a space where you guys are also looking a little deeper into some of these ICOs and figuring out, making it easier for us to figure out what makes sense and what doesn't? Absolutely. So the, the ICO Alert podcast is a, a weekly show right now. I think we, we missed last week because uh, we're uh, working on a bigger podcast studio and expanding our office space here in Pittsburgh. Um, 
but we'll have another episode coming out this week. And what we really like to do is, is do a deep dive with people who are launching ICOs. I think a, a lot of the content you might find on YouTube is, you know, short clips, maybe, you know, 10, 15 minutes. And it, it's really just kind of surface level uh, content. You know, it talks about what the ICO is and some of the problems they're solving. But what I like to do on the podcast is really go more in depth, talk about, you know, the team, you know, what drives them, um, some of the challenges they may be facing and, and ask some of the tough questions that, that the community may be um, wondering as well. Um, but what's interesting and what I think we've gotten a lot of positive feedback on, which I'm super excited about, is we've been starting this thing called the ICO Alert Roundtable. So it's kind of under that same ICO Alert podcast, but it's myself and then four other members of the, the ICO Alert team. Um, we're a team of about 15 people now in, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, and we'll swap out the other four people every week. You know, I think uh, Zach Gall, one of our data analysts, is, is on every week, but some of the other people change. And we just kind of, you know, shoot the shit, if you will, uh, if I'm allowed to say that on the show. Um, yeah. We, we, you know, talk about crypto, talk about the projects that we're interested in, talk about some of the new ICOs that are coming out. Um, and the lights in, in this space are turning off because they're, they're time automated, but you can still see me. So, um, so look, that's really glorious still. Awesome. I appreciate it. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of where we are now. Um, but as we expand our team and expand our office, like I mentioned, we are building out a podcast studio. So something we're looking to do is actually um, go a little bit more in-depth in a more intimate setting and actually fly some of these ICO you know, founders or, or team members out to our studio and do an in-person video interview with them and, and really kind of get to know them as a person and, and get to know uh, about their ICO more. So stay tuned for more content from us. I love it. Oh my gosh. I will. So those are my favorite kind. I always want, I mean, I feel like, especially as a lot of people in the business space and the crypto space, they have these incredible stories and I don't, maybe it's like the woman side of me, but human interest stuff is, is so up my alley. Now, something I did want to ask you about, which, yeah. you know, I just feel like as someone who's clearly seen a lot of things go down and probably has more experience, a lot of what people talk about at this point is that there's a lot of sort of dumping with the ICOs that they say, for example, give to these pseudo hedge funds, like special discounted rates. And then as right. soon as the ICO drops, then it seems like all of the, they, they just cascade in terms of price almost yeah. immediately after the ICO is released. So can you just talk, speak a little bit to that and, and, and reasons why someone might even ever want to get in on a presale or something when it seems like maybe a normal person might not be at might be at a disadvantage. Definitely. And I think a lot of that comes down to the actual pre-ICO structure. So I think, you know, I personally stay away from pre-ICOs where they say, hey, we're giving you a hundred percent bonus because obviously that favors those whales. It favors the hedge funds who are going to come in, buy a ton of it, and then just dump it all on day one. Whereas I think some other people do pre-sales a little bit better. Um, you know, for example, if they're running a utility token, maybe they give you special access to their platform or a discounted rate if it's, you know, a, a paid subscription in the future. So I think it, when you find a pre-ICO that is incentivizing people to contribute, um, and that incentivization model actually benefits the long-term health of that token and, and of that network, I think it's, it's much better than just offering a massive discount. Because um, it, it is kind of an interesting problem where, you know, with every token that launches and every ICO that launches, there's this whole set of, you know, token ec economics, if you were tokenomics, which is a, a word I personally hate, but seems to be used a lot in the industry. Um, there's that whole uh, kind of, economic side to it. And because of that, I think if you, as someone who's launching an ICO, if you skip over that part, it really is a crucial part and can, you know, really be detrimental to your ICO and your token price in the long run. So it's, it's something to, to definitely be aware of when you're contributing to a pre-ICO. I've got a couple of questions for you. Are you guys uh, looking to become kind of the ratings agency like S&P or Moody's or, you know, some of these different real world, you know, bond ratings companies, stock ratings companies, you know, where they have analysts covering. Do you guys see yourself getting into that as they uh, obviously come public? Are you going to be tracking this? You already do track the success, but is that something that you see building out? And, and do you offer services that are underneath to the institutional side? I'm curious. Um, I don't think so. And, and one of the interesting reasons why is that we've seen some other ICO sites do that where they'll attach, say, a rating to something and they'll say, hey, this ICO is four out of five stars. But then when something happens to the ICO, maybe they got hacked or, you know, the, the thing turned out to be a scam, that rating company really attaches their brand um, to that ICO and it can have pretty bad effects. And, and obviously, you know, we don't want to mislead people and say, hey, this is a four out of five star, go ahead and invest. Um, and then they, they get burnt. We don't want that to happen. So ultimately, our philosophy 
but it's just to provide um, really well curated objective information for our users so that they can make their own objective decisions about you know, which ICOs they want to invest in. So while we will still continue to come out with other tools and, and other ways for people to kind of um, qualify what makes an ICO good or bad on their own using our tools, we're kind of staying away from ratings. Okay. You've got a really, speaking of tools, you've got a, you guys have a tool called Clarify. And why don't you talk a little bit about that? Because Sarah and I talk about this all the time. As a trader with real money, I'm scared of a lot of these alt currencies. Where do I trade them? I'm not going to open up an account at 39 different brokers just to get right. access. Okay. So one of the things Clarify does is it verifies whether the company is legit or not. How do you, you know, talk a little bit about that and how that works? Yeah, and Clearify is one of our partners. So they actually launched an ICO with us called uh, Clearpoll earlier last year in 2017. They had a successful token sale, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, with the Poll token, and I believe they sold out. Um, and Clearify is one of their products. So what Clearify ultimately does is it, it doesn't necessarily verify whether something is legitimate or not, but it solves a really uh, crucial problem that's happening in the industry. So we saw something, for example, with Enigma Catalyst and a bunch of other ICOs where right as an ICO is starting, you know, a group of hackers or, or bad actors will hack into a website and swap out that ICO contribution address. So all these people will be ready to contribute to that ICO and they'll inadvertently end up sending millions of dollars sometimes to you know, a scammer or a hacker who just swapped out that address on the website and made it seem like the real address. So it, it, the real power in Clearify is just knowing, okay, when I send my hundred, two hundred thousand dollars, maybe much more than that, when I send this money to this address, I know for sure that this is the address of the ICO and it has not been tampered with. So Clearify is a totally decentralized system. You know, they can't come in and change those addresses. Ultimately, what's happening is an ICO is going to Clearify and they're registering their private key um, with Clearify. Clearify doesn't have access to that private key, but they're basically proving this is our address. So when you're ready to go ahead and contribute to an ICO, you can click the Clearify link on ICO alert, paste in that ICO contribution address and verify that, yes, this is the legit address. I'm not about to get scammed or, or send my money to somebody who's not this ICO. You know, one of the... One of the uh, tools that, that I liked a lot was when you really dig into uh, the performances of the uh, ICOs that have concluded. So you show, any, I think, anywhere from one day all the way out to uh, in, you know, whenever uh, they went public. I like that information. What else is underlying in there that people can find on the website that you can talk a little bit about? You know, what kind of information can they get about not only companies that are coming forward, but those that have already come? Like, you know, it doesn't end just when the company uh, comes public. Definitely. So we're working on a lot of uh, exciting tools internally um, that should, you know, add some more value there. So uh, maybe a way to, you know, document or analyze, you know, how well an ICO did, um, show things like the breakdown of uh, token distribution. You know, this is the amount that went to whales versus the amount that actually went to individual investors. Um, so we're trying to build a lot of those tools, but our partner that you mentioned, ICO Stats, does a really great job of just showing token returns. So it's, it's pretty crazy to go on there and see some of the ICOs like, uh, which was it? It's a top 10, um, not stellar. I'm forgetting the name, but it, it had like 170,000% return. So 1700 X. And it's just, it's mind boggling to look at some of those ICOs that were super successful. Of course, you know, a lot of these things do fail. A lot of them don't even reach their cap, but the ones that are successful are generally very, very successful. But uh, in terms of upcoming ICOs or, or ICOs that may be happening, you know, two weeks, three months down the line, um, we do a couple of really cool things called ICO alert reports. So ICO alert reports are um, basically a, a really helpful guide on how to join an ICO. So we'll aggregate a bunch of different information like the token price, you know, the currencies that are accepted, when the pre-ICO versus the ICO starts, the different bonus or incentive structures for each of those rounds. Um, and then we'll also uh, do a Q&A with the team. So it's a little bit different than the podcast where the podcast is more of that in-depth, you know, hour long, hey, let's get to the meat of this thing and, and figure out if this project is you know, really good. Whereas the Q&A in our ICO alert reports is more of a, kind of an overview. We'll actually ask the community for their own questions. And it, it's interesting because, um, you know, some of these ICOs, they, they don't want to answer the tough questions, you know, whether it puts them in a weird spot or maybe they don't know the answer to that question. We've had a lot of success with our reports and being able to go to these ICOs and say, hey, 
these are the 10 questions that the community are asking, plus here are some that we wanna know. Tell us the answer to this question, just be straight up with us, and we provide that information in this report. So that's been super helpful and we've gotten great feedback there. So are you, are you free to talk a little bit about your business model and how you, how you guys make money? Definitely. Yeah, we're super transparent about this in terms of, uh, you know, the disclaimer you see on our website. Um, we do offer promotion to ICOs. So our users come to us, they use our site to, you know, do that discovery process to find out about the new ICOs, to read our reports, maybe to listen to the podcast or in the future, watch some of our video content. Um, but we, we make money off of promoting ICOs. So when you see, you know, an ICO that's featured in purple or, or that banner at the top of the page, um, that's something that, you know, an ICO has come to us and they've paid us for, you know, they know that we have really engaged users coming to the site and they want to get access to some of that traffic. So that's how we make money right now. Um, but in the near future, we're looking at releasing some really cool features, you know, some other premium investment tools where users will be able to pay, you know, a nominal fee, maybe 10, 20, $30 a month and get access to some really powerful trading and analysis tools to, you know, further, um, uh, I guess, to empower people to really make those objective decisions about ICOs and, and which ones they want to invest in or not invest in. I mean, once you get the traffic, you can just go or wherever you want with it. You Definitely. can do a million things. Well, I think with this sort of flood of ICOs that we see coming and that we have seen coming in the last year, a question I would love to ask someone like you who's seeing a lot of it is just what, what do you see as the future of this sort of cascade of, of ICOs coming at us? Yeah, I think you know, one of the biggest things that I think is going to happen in 2018 is we're going to see the introduction of kind of a new asset class. So an asset class within cryptocurrency. So if you think of ICOs as that first major asset class, um, these I think are going to be clarified more this year as purely utility tokens. So for example, the, the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the, the people responsible for regulating these things in the US have explicitly stated that, you know, not all ICOs are securities, but many are but they, they kind of validated the utility token model and saying, hey, if your ICO is it, you know, it has a token, and that token has utility on day one when you're selling that token. And if you meet a, a couple other um, you know, data points, then you're a pure utility token and not a security. So what I think is gonna happen is we're gonna see that asset class of ICOs focus more on those utility tokens. And then we're gonna see the emergence of a new asset class called STOs or security token offerings that are very explicitly securities. They're, you know, regulated, they're going through all those same traditional finance processes and are subject to that same regulation. And I think that'll be a really good way for people to understand, okay, here's an ICO, it's a utility token, I don't have to be registered investor to participate, I just need to do my own due diligence before I invest, versus an STO will be more for the institutional crowd, um, you know, to invest in an offering like a file coin or um, the one that happened recently, Telegram's Ton platform. So I think we're going to see a lot more of those STOs this year that are explicitly calling themselves STOs versus ICOs. Totally. It makes sense. Now, I do not want to cut this short, and I do hope that we get to have you on again at some point. But for before we close it up, let's yeah. uh, let the, the viewers and listeners know where they can find you. Absolutely. So uh, you can reach me on Twitter at Finchify, F-I-N-C-H-I-F-Y. Um, but the best place to, to reach out is icoalert.com. We have a great contact form there if you want to reach out. Maybe you have an idea for the site. There's a tool that you really, really want to be built. Um, we'd love to get your feedback on that. Maybe, you know, you want the list to be designed in a different way. You want, uh, you know, the option to, you know, see that information in some other um, layout. Let us know. You can also find us on Twitter at icoalert. Um, we tweet a lot uh, of our reports. We tweet some cool industry stats like the 1,848 ICOs that happened last year. Um, so yeah, icoalert.com and at icoalert on Twitter. And is that also where you guys will be putting this, this podcast slash video content coming up? It is, yeah. So we post all of our podcasts there. Um, we, we pin the tweet every week of our latest podcast episode and all of our video content will come there as well. Um, and of course, we'll be posting it on YouTube, uh, youtube.com slash icoalert there too. I can't wait. It sounds awesome. Thank you awesome. so much, Rob. It was really great to have you on. We know you're super, super busy, but we really, really appreciate it. Yeah. And thank you so much. This has been great. And I'd love to come on in the future, maybe when we have that new office space and you know, we can record this from the podcast studio and, and talk a little bit about STOs and ICOs and, and the craziness that has happened you know, six months from yeah. now. Absolutely, We are Rob. here for you, buddy. We are here awesome. for you. <laughs> we're, we're, nice coming to Pits, we're coming to Pittsburgh and we're coming there in the summer. Absolutely. Drive, that sounds great. Cars. We'll see you there. Yeah. Come on down and we'll, uh, we'll record an episode. You can hang out, meet the team. That'd be great. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Talk to you guys later.